Hello everyone, in this video we are going to consider what happens when we place a charged particle, and the words a point charge, outside a conducting sphere. So we've got a diagram of the setup um, up at the top left of the screen. Um, we've got our sphere with radius r. Uh, I've put this x here representing the center of the sphere, which is also the origin of our coordinate system. So we're placing the sphere at the origin of our coordinate system. And our charged particle is over here, it has a charge of capital Q. It's on the x-axis, and so it has coordinates of d, 0, 0, and so d is the, the distance along the x-axis from the center of the sphere. So the way in which we're going to approach this is to use the method of images, which in turn relies on the uniqueness theorem for Poisson's equation. Um, I have done a video on that in the past if you're not familiar with that, but the basic idea is that in electrostatics, the surface of a conductor is an equipotential surface. So what we do is try to come up with a system of point charges which can have various different charges and be at various different positions but we try to come up with the just the right system of point charges um, that produces an equipotential surface that happens to coincide with our uh, conductor if we can do that then the uniqueness theorem guarantees that our solution is the same solution that we would get if we just had placed a conductor there in the first place. So having said that, let's consider this uh, related system that I've just uh, put on the screen here, where instead of conductor, you just have two point charges. You have a point charge of charge lowercase q with an x coordinate of a over here. You've got your other point charge with a uh, charge of capital Q, which has an x coordinate of b. So the charge on the right is kind of equivalent to the charge that we had outside the conducting sphere originally and we're going to try to figure out how we should choose the lowercase q charge. Now if we want to know the shape of the equipotential surfaces of this system then we better write down an expression for the potential as a function of the coordinates x, y, and z. So let's just write down v electric potential of x, y, and z. Um, it's just going to be a sum of two Coulomb potentials basically and so you get a prefactor of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, assuming this is all in a, in a vacuum. So that's going to factor out the front and there's going to be a different contribution from each point charge. The lowercase q1 is going to have a small q on the top. Um, now the Coulomb potential is inversely proportional to distance. So we want an expression on the denominator, which is basically the distance of some arbitrary um, set of coordinates uh, to the point a0,0. Zero, zero. We can get that using Pythagoras basically. Um, we just have to subtract a from x, right, because that's x minus a is the displacement along the x-axis between an arbitrary point and the point a0,0. Zero, zero. We square that and we add on y squared and z squared because the y and z coordinates of the lowercase q charge are zero. And then we do that and we square root it, in other words, do it to the power of a half. Okay. Then we can have a very similar looking term from the capital Q charge, so it's capital Q over, uh, basically we just have to replace the a with a b, so we do x minus b squared plus y squared plus z squared um, for the same reason, that's the power of a half, and then we close our brackets. Now an equipotential surface, the equation of an equipotential surface is given by setting all of that equal to a constant, which in general is going to give some very complicated looking expression. However, um, things can simplify quite nicely if we consider specifically the surface of zero potential. So let's set v equal to zero, which is the same as setting the bracketed term equal to zero. So if v is zero, then I can copy this whole first term. And if the bracketed term is supposed to be zero, then that is supposed to be basically the negative of the capital Q term, right? So these are equal, but I just have to put a minus sign. Then they'll cancel each other out. And this is um, sort of the implicit equation of the zero potential surface. We can tidy this up a little bit, make it look a bit nicer by um, putting the charges, the Qs on the same side and squaring everything to remove the powers of a half. So if I square everything and put the Qs on the same side, I get Q squared over Q squared, small Q squared over big Q squared um, is going to be so x minus a squared plus y squared plus z squared. Um, and then we'll just divide that by x plus b squared plus y squared plus z squared. No powers of half because we have now squared everything. So let's expand the brackets and see what happens. We've got q squared over q squared. Um, 
on the numerator, we expand the brackets, we're going to get x squared plus a squared minus 2ax. Now, your x squared that you get by expanding will combine with the y squared and the z squared. Right, you've got this quantity x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which has a special significance. It is basically r squared in spherical polar coordinates. Right? r squared is just x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Um, the interpretation of that r is just the distance of your point uh, from the origin. So we can group our x squared, y squared, and z squared together and write the numerator as r squared and then you've still got your a squared and your minus 2ax from expanding the brackets, right? And by a similar logic, our denominator is going to be almost identical, but again with b's instead of a's. So r squared plus um, b squared, and then minus 2bx. So let's try to get some insight into what that surface actually is. So let's first get rid of the fraction um, on the right-hand side. I'm going to multiply through by the denominator of the right-hand side to get q squared over q squared times r squared, and then plus q squared over q squared times b squared, and then minus 2 q squared over q squared times bx. And then on the right-hand side, we just have remaining r squared plus a squared minus um, 2ax. So let's move some terms around and put similar terms together so we can put the r squared terms together and the x terms together. If we move the r squareds onto the left-hand side and factor out the r squared, you're going to get r squared times q squared over q squared minus 1, right? That minus 1 is coming from moving that circle term over to the left. Um, if we put everything else on the right-hand side, then you have a constant term, which is a squared minus this b squared term, so a squared minus q squared over q squared b squared. And then we put the x's together and we can factor out a 2x so we're going to get plus 2x. We get a contribution from that first term, which is q squared over q squared times b. And then, then you've got your minus a from the term that was already on the right-hand side, so minus a uh, like that. Now, this still looks pretty complicated, but remember that we are considering a sort of hypothetical system of point charges, which we are free to control the parameters of um, in whatever way is convenient for us. So Although this is a complicated looking expression, it takes on a particularly simple form. Let me just note this down. It takes on a simple form if the x term vanishes. And that can happen provided that we choose q, q, and b, and a in just the right um, proportion. So it's basically going to be simple if a is equal to q squared over q squared times b, right? Because the bracket term next to the x is then going to just uh, vanish. So what does that imply? So let's say then. Um, you've got r squared times, well, this ratio of q squared to q squared, if we're saying that this is true, right, considering this special case, then q squared over q squared is just the same as a over b. So we get r squared times a over b minus 1. Um, we can't really do anything with the a squared over there. Um, we again replace this squared charge ratio with a over b. So we are subtracting off a over b. Um, times b squared, and by the choice that we made, that third term is now just 0. And so the right-hand side of this simplifies to a squared minus ab, right, just by dividing uh, by that b there. And then I'm going to factor out an ab. The reason for doing that will become clear in just a moment. If I factor out ab, I have to have a over b as my first term, right, because I wanted to have a squared as my first term in the expanded version, and then I just subtract 1. Um, now, this is a good thing because you have an a over b minus 1 on both sides. Now, note that a over b minus 1 cannot be 0 because then a would be equal to b and we'd have two charges on top of each other, and that wouldn't really make a lot of sense. Um, and so we can divide through by a over b minus 1, and we get the result that r squared is equal to ab, right? So our zero potential surface has simplified very nicely to r squared equals ab, where r is the radius in spherical polar coordinates. So I've just written out a little summary of the results that we've got so far. If we choose our parameters in such a way that a equals q squared over q squared times b, 
then the potential is zero everywhere on the surface defined by r squared equals a b. Um, now, what does that surface look like? Well, it's a surface of constant r, it's a surface of constant distance from the origin, and therefore it is a sphere centered on the origin, which is a good sign because we're trying to solve the problem of a point charge outside a conducting sphere. How big is the radius of that sphere? Well, notice that if a is less than b, which we can see from the diagram up here, is the case where a is closest to the, to the origin, the way that I've drawn it, then a squared is less than ab, which is less than b squared, right? This follows because a is a smaller number, so if you square it, you get a small number. Um, if b is bigger, then squaring that will get you a bigger number, and ab is sort of somewhere in the middle of those two. Um, if you square root all of the parts of this inequality, then you get a is less than root ab, but root ab is just r, right? The radius of our equipotential sphere. So we can say a is less than r, which is less than b. So we have an equipotential sphere of zero potential whose radius is somewhere in between the positions of our two point charges. So I've just added that equipotential sphere onto our diagram of the top left. So having established that we get this spherical equipotential surface, then we can revisit our original question, um, which is basically this diagram that I've drawn down here where we have a conducting sphere and a point charge outside it. Um, you'll notice that I have grounded the conducting sphere for the time being. Um, we'll consider at the end um, what the difference would be if it was not grounded, but let's assume for the time being that it's grounded, which basically means it's connected to an infinite source or sink of electrons or charges that can move around. And so it can acquire whatever charge it needs to in order to, uh, to, to solve the problem. So we know that using the method of images, we can put uh, sort of an image charge inside the sphere um, using the equations that we derived earlier. Um, let me just write this down. Where do we want to put the image charge? So let's say that uh, the image charge is located at a certain point. Um, from the fact that r squared is a, b, a and b were the x coordinates uh, of our two charges, right? Here, uh, the d is basically like the equivalent of the b that we had before, and therefore the x coordinate of your image charge, um, which is like the a in that equation, is basically r squared divided by d. So your image charge has to be at r squared over d, and what should its charge be? So let's say with a charge given by um, q equals, well the charge will come from this equation that links a, b, and the two q's together. Um, remembering that a is like the x that we've um, placed our image charge at, and b is basically the same as d. Uh, we rearrange that, and you get q is the square root of um, a over b, which is like x over d, multiplied by capital Q, which is a, uh, a fixed value for the problem. Um, Remember that we've taken a square root when we do this. We actually want the negative square root. So I'm going to put a minus sign there because you can basically see by looking at the, the potential, you've got those two terms in your potential as a function of position, and they are never going to combine to give zero if the two q's have the same sign, right? So you've got to make sure that the two charges have uh, the opposite signs to each other. Um, x was not one of the original parameters of the problem. So we want to rewrite this using r instead this is the same as minus the square root of r squared over d squared times q, right? That follows from the value of x on the previous line. Um, and then we just take the square root and we find that the image charge is minus r over d um, times the charge that we put outside the conducting sphere. So that's quite a nice, neat result that we just take. Um, we just come up with an image charge. We put it at an x-coordinate on the x-axis given by that value, and we give it that um, that charge. How does that help to find the electric field? Well, um, basically what we're saying is that the electric field in this system, outside the sphere at least, is completely equivalent to the electric field that you would get by having a superposition of the original charge and its image charge, right? So I'm not actually going to even bother writing down an expression for the electric fields because that will be, there'll be, a lot of various parameters around and I don't think it will be particularly um, enlightening but if you wanted to do that you could just write it out as a sum of two uh, Coulomb 
like electric fields due to the original charge and its image charge. And you can see a, uh, a diagram of how that looks in the thumbnail of the video. Finally, what if the sphere is not grounded? Does that make a difference? Well, um, if it was not grounded, then the, uh, the sphere would have no charge, assuming that it didn't have some initial charge, right? If it was uncharged initially, then it can't suddenly gain a, uh, a charge. However, um, according to our, our image charge, right, given by that expression at the bottom right there, to satisfy the, the, the problem, our conductor should have that same amount of total charge. So this solution doesn't actually work if the sphere is not grounded because the sphere cannot acquire the charge that it needs. However, there's an easy solution to this. Um, we can, if this, so remember this was um, our lowercase q charge, we need a way of guaranteeing that the charge of our conductor stays zero overall, but we need to keep the spherical symmetry of the problem. Uh, we can do that by placing another image charge at the very center of the sphere. That's not going to change the, the symmetry of the problem, right? But we just give it an equal and opposite charge minus lowercase q. Um, and if you add together the electric fields due to the charge outside the sphere and these two image charges inside the sphere, that will give you the solution um, in the case of a non-grounded and uncharged sphere. In practice, how would that make a difference to what the charged particle outside the sphere does? Um, well, Notice that, let me do this in different color, the charge particle outside is going to be attracted to the original image charge, right? Because remember Q and Q, the two Qs have opposite signs. So there's an attraction there. Um, but this new image charge that we've just added, this one over here is going to be repelling this one because they actually have the same sign, right? So there is a stronger force of attraction between the particle and the conducting sphere um, if the conducting sphere is grounded, because then it can pick up as much charge as it needs, right? If it's isolated, if it's not grounded, then there's still a force of attraction because you you get like a separation of charge, right? Um, on the top and bottom layers of the conductor. Um, but because it's neutral overall, you have a, a, a weaker force and that's reflected in the method of images by this sort of repulsive charge at the center of the sphere. One final word of warning is that the solution that you get um, from the method of images only applies exterior to the, uh, the spherical conductor, right? Inside any conductor in electrostatics, there is zero electric field, right? So the total electric field in this scenario is zero inside the conductor, and then this superposition of either two or three uh, charges exterior to the conductor. So thanks for watching, I hope it's been interesting, and I will see you again soon for some more physics discussions.